Welcome to the fifth episode of the Cranmore Co-op Harmony of History series of podcasts. These podcasts describe lectures and stories of shared history in conversation with community members and guest lecturers. This series is supported and funded through the International Fund for Ireland under the Peace Impact Programme. Along with Marcella McGarry and Ken Gunning, we will take you through a series of recorded workshop talks and lectures held in Cranmore. We are delighted to have as our fifth episode guest, Dr. Marion McGarry. Dr. McGarry is author of The Irish Cottage, History, Culture and Design, 2017, and the forthcoming Irish Customs and Rituals, How Our Ancestors Celebrated Life in the Seasons, both published by Open Press. She is the co-author of the book, See the Wood from the Trees, 2017, and lectures at Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. Thank you very much for coming, guys. You're very welcome. Good to see you all and happy New Year to you. And um, tonight we have Dr. Marion McGarry. And as I explained in the email and talking to people, um, Marion is going to talk about, um, I suppose, shared aspects of Irish folk traditions. And I've heard Marion speak before, and I suppose in relation to what we've been doing the last couple of weeks in relation to history, culture, exchanges about difference, um, conversations we've had about politics, about religion, um, a little bit different, but on the same track. Okay, so I'll hand over to Dr. Marion Barry. Uh, thank you very much, and hello everybody. Um, so yeah, I suppose this, I had a feel, I was chatting to people this evening, and I had a feel about the previous types of speakers that you've had in this series, and yeah, mine is a little bit different focuses on shared aspects of Irish folk tradition and it kind of goes beyond what we think we know and back into the really distant past. We're talking about pre-Christian because I suppose at the end of the day most people in Ireland are Christian and the stuff that um, I'm going to be talking about tonight will be looking at um, pre-Christian customs, pagan customs, very ancient customs, but ones that we still use today no matter what religion we are in this country there's things that we believe in that are connected to the other world, um, but not necessarily because they're connected to the other world. It might just be something your parents believed in or there's something that you believe in um, that you just continue on regardless. And a great example of this is the Lone Hawthorn. Do you see it there? Yeah. So have you all seen these um, in fields the length yeah. and breadth of the country? Yeah. Um, farmers today, as we know, they're very well-educated people and they usually have computerised gadgets and all sorts of things sat now in their tractors and everything. But they still won't cut these down. And why? They're not quite sure, but they're not going to take any chances. So it's really interesting in a country, and these farmers could be Protestant, they could be Catholic, they could be any kind of religion at all. But this is one true kind of folk religion that we all kind of subscribe to and we all kind of believe it without knowing really why. Um, and I think the, the Lone Hawthorn is a great example and it's kind of like the epitome of customs that I'm going to be talking about tonight. But I suppose, Marcella, if you could hit the lights there. Yes, um, really what I'm going to kind of look at tonight before I, I talk about any of those kind of really creepy, interesting ones is just general folk customs of Ireland. Again, this is not something we uh, were educated at school about, but the stuff that our parents would have taught us. And it goes the length and breadth of the island, you know. Um, folk customs are mostly apolitical. And um, even though we all kind of converted to Christianity in the fifth century or thereabouts, um, we still kind of held on to these despite what the various church teachings are on these. Um, so, and I'm going to kind of look at shared traditions on these. So, folk architecture and co folk customs are going to look at aspects of architecture as well, and they're shared between everyone on the island, no matter what their religion. And really, I suppose we'll take away the books from urban Ireland to rural Ireland, um, and especially rural farmers, where a lot of folk customs and architecture and ways of doing things are linked to the land and land use. And what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to explore some aspects of the dwellings of Ireland and folk architecture, but I'm also going to look at folk beliefs, fairies, superstitions and ways of doing things. And this is linked in with the Irish calendar year. And um, so if we look at the Irish calendar year, it's split into four seasons, but our seasons, our Celtic seasons, didn't really start um, in the way that seasons are kind of formatted today. So we're, our spring is, is going to be starting now in another couple of weeks, 
31st of January, 1st of February, we're going to celebrate St. Bridget's Eve and Bridget's Day um, uh, chronologically, if you like. One comes after the other. Um, and that's called In Bulk. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Because we're close to it, I'll go into a bit more detail about In Bulk at the end. And that's followed by Valsana, as we know, May 1st. That's followed by Lunasa. Sorry, In Bulk is spring, Valsana is uh, summer. Lunasa is autumn, and then finally Samhain is winter. So we're still in Samhain, we're still in the kind of sleepy part of the year. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about that. And that acts like, if you're, I just uh, spoke there about farmers being all computerised and modern, but back in the day they weren't, they didn't have clocks in prehistory. So these festivals were like a marker for the clock of the year, if you like. And they were very important, and they kind of told people where they were and what they should really be doing. So I'm going to look at the aspects of that as we go on. But first of all, one of the most important kind of shared cultural connections uh, between us all on the island is architecture, and particularly vernacular architecture. To see how I have it kind of underlined there, vernacular architecture. And um, what is vernacular architecture? Well, it's a type of architecture that's not formal. No trained architect was ever involved in vernacular architecture. And it doesn't respond to trends, so it kind of stays the same, people looking the same the whole time. And um, so it's a type of folk architecture, and it's linked with folk customs, shared between everyone on the island, no matter what their religion. Um, and it's linked to land and climate, rather than politics. Um, so you're, really I'll be focusing on vernacular thatched cottages in this talk tonight, for, for the first part of it anyway. And we can see there, there's a farmer out repairing his thatched roof. Um, and we kind of associate the cottage with um, that stereotypical picture of Ireland, don't we? Um, you know, the thatched cottage. Now, that picture there, disclaimer, that's John Hind postcard. I'm sure you remember those. Technicolor, always with something very Irish looking on it. Red-haired children and donkeys, um, thatched cottages, and so on and so forth. But what happened was we kind of politicised the cottage a little bit in this country because it did become emblematic of a certain type of Irish cultural identity. So do you remember that um, famous De Valera speech where he was talking about his vision for Ireland was people dancing at the crossroads and he was talking about people living in um, homesteads and having an open fire and all this sort of thing. All very progressive if you're in the 1930s, but you see, you probably can't see it very well, but you see the Unionist poster here from the same period. Now if you look there, there's the Unionist candidate, and he's pointing towards the prosperous, industrialised north, and there's a little little um, uh, hamlet, if you like, of factories he's pointing towards, with smoke coming out of the chimneys. And that's the UK. And then if you look over there, do you see the fella sitting on the wall, the rather downcast fella? That's De Valera, and behind him is a thatched cottage and a stack of turf. So that's what's in the era republic. So your man there, the unionist, is saying, it's better with us, you know, it's more prosperous. When you think of it, he's actually, you know, de Valera's vision was backwards. And uh, a lot of people would argue that de Valera brought the country backwards with him, which is, don't get me started on him. But anyway, <laughs> um, but that's the way that patched cottages kind of became politicized, because they became, became emblematic of a certain type of Irishness. And um, they also became connected with tourism as well, and that kind of myth was perpetuated. And of course the emigrants gone abroad, you'll always have them coming back with that sentimental um, idea of finding the homestead, um, and, and so on and so forth. But it, it's not the case at all. Um, Irish cottages um, are, are not emblematic of a, of a certain type of Irishness. They're emblematic of rural I Ireland on the whole of the island in reality. Um, so if we look here at Paul Henry, of course, and um, we have a Belfast man with us here. Paul Henry was the son of a Belfast Baptist, I think he was a minister's father. And um, Paul Henry, uh, long story, I could be here all night. Uh, I want to check my, um, my time here because I, I, I do tend to ramble on, Marcella will tell you there. Um, but he was the son of a Belfast Baptist and he saw in these cottages the very essence of Ireland, no matter what um, religion the inhabitants subscribed to. And he saw them as emblematic of the actual land, that they could grow organically from the land as well. And he actually uh, was one of the people that kind of perpetuated the myth of um, 
Ireland uh, being um, personified in these cottages because he did these um, tourism posters um, for the London Midland and Scottish Railway and they used this as the image of Ireland. Um, but while we have him doing posters of Irish cottages in Connemara, like that one there, you can see it there, I'm pointing but you can't see it on the screen, but the one on the left there is Connemara. And then the one on the right is for Northern Ireland. And you can see it's pretty much the same cottage and landscape. So that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, we have it fixed in our heads, but it's not actually the case. Um, they're an all-Irish um, cultural uh, identity, really, uh, that's um, inhabited in these cottages. Um, and I suppose when you look at what cottages represent, they represent certain building styles, methods and materials, but they also are the dwellings of the superstitions and mindsets of the people. Um, and you have all sorts of things going on in cottages. They're the backdrop for daily life and they're the backdrop for special occasions such as births, marriages and deaths. Um, I'll just quickly move on and I'll try and define what I mean by cottage. So when I talk about cottages, what I mean in the context of this lecture is that they're the rural vernacular, three-room, thatched dwellings, which became the most common rural house after the Great Famine and until the mid-20th century. And few are still in use in their original states. Um, so that's, you know, there's your woman there with her children outside her lovely thatched cottage. Most people in Ireland didn't, who lived in these didn't refer to them as cottages. They called them their houses. They thought cottage was a rather kind of denigrating term. A cottage came to mean a very small house, but um, not to the people who lived in them. They were very proud of these little houses, as they called them. And again, just to touch base there again on what vernacular architecture is. So it's built by the people without the interve intervention of an architect. And it's a response to location, climate and available materials. It doesn't follow trends in architecture, so that means houses like this have a timeless quality. So when we look at um, post-famine Irish cottages, before the famine, if you see, you see the, the dwelling there, it's just about call it mm. dwelling on the right, the black and white one there, most of the inhabitants, the poorer inhabitants of rural Ireland, the length and breadth of the island, would have lived in those. And they were cabins, and they were one room, and they had pretty appalling living conditions in them. But after the famine, unfortunately, an awful lot of the poorer population were swept away either by emigration or starvation or disease or whatever. But you basically had the land start to become a little bit wealthier and this is reflected in the houses of the inhabitants. So most Irish houses in the rural parts of Ireland after the famine became these kind of three room typical cottages that were a bit more prosperous. Um, and I talk in a lot of my publications about how these replaced mud cabins, did they kind of reflect uh, a type of survivor's guilt? Was there a psychology in us as Irish people that, you know, we became prosperous after the famine in many ways, but was there a survivor's guilt attached to that? And, you know, you have all these kind of uh, ideas about uh, certain stereotypical problems connected with the Irish and, um, you know, could, could survivors guilt be one of, the, one of the roots of that? But basically, these new cottages um, reflected uh, an increased hygiene, growing prosperity, respectability, and they kind of become more linked with Catholicism as well, in many ways. Uh, because the church's power was growing post-famine, and by church I mean the Roman Catholic Church. And they were began to, beginning to um, tell people what to do a lot more and their power in telling people what to do was, was becoming stronger and stronger and it reached its kind of apogee in the mid to late 20th century. Um, and within that they were telling people don't be subscribing to these superstitious customs, right, and I'm going to go into detail about what they were, and keep your house clean because cleanliness is next to godliness and, and so on and so forth. There was other ways that they were telling people what to do but um, they were, they were two kind of chief tenets of what they were. And they were really trying to stamp out an awful lot of the superstitions. Just uh, going back very quickly here to the types of cottage. So in Sligo, in the north of Ireland, um, we have a particular type of cottage. And then in the southerly, southeastern parts of Ireland, we have another different type. And these were defined by Kevin Danaher, the folklorist, um, as direct entry and lobby entry. 
And the ones that we have, you see the map of Ireland here, and you have direct entry, and it runs all the way from Antrim all the way down to kind of West Cork. And then we have the lobby entry, which goes in the kind of the southeasterly kind of axis of that, if you like. And it really brings it into kind of stark um, focus, really, I suppose, that it's an all-island type of architecture, do you know? Direct entry are found in the, in the northerly half, and the lobby entry are fa found in the southeasterly half. And there's a lot of um, speculation as to why lobby entry um, ended up in the southeasterly part of the country. A lot of people say it took lots of influences from the Normans and the, the whole idea of the pale and so on and so forth, but um, nobody can exactly tell you why the houses look as, look as they do. But to outward, um, to look at them from their outwardly aspects, um, the only real difference is the roof, but there are differences in the internal layout, and I'll go into that now. The main commonalities between the two types is that they're linear, not symmetrical. So you don't have a door and a window and a window. You have your window, door, window, window generally, either left or right-handed. Um, and there's speculation that these cottages kind of developed um, in commonality with the urn house, which is northern European um, vernacular dwelling houses that were long houses effectively. Um, so we go into them in detail now and we'll have a look at the layout. Now the direct entry, remember, is the type that we're familiar with here in the north and uh, northwest and west of the island. And it's typified by raised gables. So you see the gables on each end are raised. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you look at the plan of the house there and you look at the main door at the front, you walk straight into the kitchen and you look to the opposite wall and you have the fireplace, the hearth. That's the central aspect of the house. And um, there's usually no windows to the rear of these houses. And the front door faces the back door. Do you see that? You can just walk through the house. Um, and I have in brackets there, milking parlour origins. And this might seem a bit insane, but most people, um, a lot of these houses would have evolved from originally a one-room house. So it could be a one-room house with extensions either side, as the years went on and as the family got more prosperous. But that one-room house would have started out life as a buyer dwelling. Did you ever hear of these? So basically, you would have had the cows on one end, and the humans in the other end. And, you know, it might sound a bit outrageous, but people who lived in these would have been quite better off than some people in the country because they had livestock and they had a warm house. Because you can imagine three or four cattle in a house. <laughs> it's nice and toasty, you know, it might be a bit smelly, but it's toasty enough on a winter's night. And the cows are happy too because they're getting the reciprocal heat off that fire. So, um, that's in the northwest, these are the typical kind of layouts of the house. And then flanking the kitchen on both sides, you have bedrooms. And then do you see I have bed written on the top half, just opposite, up yeah. above the hearth there. They're called a bed out shot. And that is the type of built-in bed you have beside the fire there. Mm -hmm. um, and remember, this is an era before nursing homes ever existed in the country. But Granny and Grandad would have been moved mm -hmm. in there. And they would have lived, they, that would be the retirement bed, if you like. So um, it's said that by kind of moving the grandparents in there, when the eldest son inherited the house and got married and started his own family, by moving the grandparents into the bed outshot, they remained central in the, in the life of the home. So we're able to still offer an opinion and have the important seat up beside the fire. And we can see there, see the colour picture there of the cottage? Mm -hmm. uh, do you see the, the projection of the wall there mm -hmm. um, on that? That's a bed out shot. That's actually in Glen Columkill Folk Park. It's an absolutely fabulous place if you want to go up and visit it. Absolutely wonderful. It's a purpose-built folk park and you can actually walk in and interact with all these lovely buildings. Um, and you also see the pegs in the wall of that colour photo mm -hmm. and the rope on the roof. That's actually tying down the thatch against the Atlantic winds. You get that an awful lot on the western coast. So that's a feature of, of cottages in Donegal, in Mayo, in western parts of Galway and in west parts of Cork. Um, so it's, it's useful. So we'll move on from there to the lobby entry. Uh, oh yes, here, um, the colour pictures here are... That's what the bed out shot actually would have looked like. Um, that example there, that's another, the middle picture there is from Glen Folk Park and the one on the right is an example from Bunratty. So, um, and if you want to see an example close to home, there's a great bed out shot in Dolly's Cottage in Strand Hill. You can go up and have a look at that, it's a great little building. 
Now, the lobby entry then are, you know, uh, slightly different uh, in terms of the layout. So if we look at the layout first on this slide, you can see you walk straight in and the hearth is in front of you. Do you remember the hearth was on the opposite wall when you walked into the house? And instead of just walking in and, you know, stumbling in at people sitting around the fire, you have a little wall there with a window in it. And um, that little wall is called um, the spear wall or the spy wall or the holland, depending on what part of the southeast you lived in. Um, and it's, these are called lobby entries because, in effect, these little walls created a lobby, if you like, walking into these houses. And after that, it's pretty much the same layout. There's usually no back door on these houses, so you didn't have that buyer tradition in these parts of the country. Um, and again, bedrooms off the kitchen, again. And um, the hipped gables on the outside are a big feature as well. So down around like um, Wexford, Waterford, Kilmore Quay, down that direction, even lots and lots of these. Um, if we go back and look at the furniture placement then in your typical direct entry, so coming back up to our region here, you have your um, holy trinity of furniture, I call it, uh, the dresser, the table, and the settle. They're the three main types of furniture in a kitchen, and no matter how rich or poor you were, you had these three types of furniture. If you were, a, even a very impoverished person would have some attempt at a dresser. If they didn't have a full dresser, they'd have a shelf on the wall on which to display a little bit of crockery. Um, it was a real marker for poverty if you didn't have any kind of dresser at all. And, um, you know, if, if I had longer to spend with you, I could talk about furniture types. I'm, I'm checking the the time there all the time because I, I, I could ramble on about this all evening and I don't want to keep you here all night. Anyway, so that's your overall layout of furniture and then the bedrooms would be more sparsely furnished. You might have a chest for clothes or a clothes press, you know press, the word press for cupboard. That's a real kind of Irish Scottish term because literally that would mean to press the clothing um, to keep it pressed. Um, and uh, you would have that, but apart from that, all activity is taking place in the kitchen. And that hearth is very important. And I'll just talk about it here, because there's all sorts of, sorts of social things going on around the hearth. First of all, it's for cooking. Um, it's a social space. It actually can light the house. We're all very spoiled today with electricity, but back in the day when the, when the sun went down, you I and mean, candles were quite expensive, you would huddle around the fire and try and get as much light out of it as well as heat. Um, it's a focal point of the home. And you have a certain um, seating hierarchy around it as well. If you walked into a cottage and there's two seats either side of the fire, you wouldn't take either of those seats. It would be the height of rudeness just to land yourself into the seat beside the fire. Um, you'd have to be offered it. And um, even, even then, it's reserved for the mother and the father of the house. Um, and to be offered it is a great honour. But um, the other thing then that you would have going on around the fire is eating. So an awful lot of us look to the Mediterraneans and think how great they are. With their, they all can sit around a table and they can all eat their very healthy food and they can drink wine without overdoing it. And why can't we be more like them? You know, the Mediterranean uh, people are great for sitting around a table and enjoying their food. We don't have that table culture in Ireland. Um, we tended to take our dinners in our laps and um, eat around the fire. And, and a table, a board, I think board is associated with meetings, a table in Ireland is really for doing your work at. It's for having an important meeting, it's for preparing your food, and usually around the hearth is where you actually take your food. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much for not being like the Mediterranean people, <coughs> fancy food methods. Um, but anyway, so just going back here to um, a very important part of the fire, of course, is that it shouldn't be allowed out. And it's a whole focal point for superstition um, and rituals in the house. Um, so <coughs> this kind of brings me on to the whole topic of belief systems and people, because Ireland, as I said, was a Christian country. Um, you know, from, from, the, from the 5th century on, we were converted to Christianity. But we still held on to our pagan customs. No matter what type of Christianity you went for, we were still very much um, hanging on to pagan uh, customs just to be on the safe side. And as a result, the Christian church recognised this and co-opted an awful lot of pagan sites 
to make them Christian, to make it a bit easier for people to understand and to bring the flock over. So a great example of this is Holy Wells, is that an awful lot of those would have started out as ancient sites, um, but were taken over where a saint's name was put on them, crosses were put at them, and they became holy sites. And there's an awful lot of other things as well that um, we held on to, that were co-opted, but um, there's an awful lot of things we held on to that the church really did not like either. And by church, I'm referring to my own experience <laughs> and the Catholic church, right? Um, for example, the station. That's Mass in a Connemara cabin there by Aloysius O'Kelly, a beautiful painting in the National Gallery. And it's painted by him depicting a moment where a Catholic congregation are hearing Mass in a cabin. And we think of the station Mass, and the station, just to explain exactly what that is, is where Mass is held in a house and in a community, and neighbours take their turn in having the Mass, and it's done maybe every half a year or every year or every quarter, it depends on the area you live in. And it's a great honour to get the station, and all your neighbours come, and the priest hears confession, and then he says Mass, and you all have a lovely meal. That's not a Roman Catholic tradition, that's an Irish tradition. And the Catholic Church didn't really, they went along with it, but they didn't really like doing it. Um, and that painting there, and again, I could, I could talk to you for an hour about that painting alone, because um, this is a public gathering in the mid-19th century in Ireland. And, you know, the, the argument is, as soon as that priest is gone, that crowd are going to have a meeting about something. And uh, it's a very interesting story, even attached to that painting. Um, but it's, it's seen as kind of a way, I suppose the Roman Catholic Church kept things like stations, but kind of rumbled about them a little bit. Um, but really kind of kept them on to appease the people, to kind of keep them on board. And remember that painting is maybe 1850s, 1860s, I can't remember the year there, but it's around that. And this is the time when the church is really developing, the Catholic Church, I mean, is really developing that, that hold over the country. Um, so just going back to, that's one pagan, if, if you like, perhaps not pagan, but it's definitely non-Catholic custom. Uh, another thing as well, um, again, church tried to stamp out was the pattern. So people going on pattern pilgrimages to Holy Wells. Um, and that's where if a saint's day came up, and let's say it was St. Patrick's Holy Well and St. Patrick's Day, and people would have a pattern where a massive congregation would turn up and they'd do the rounds at the Holy Well and then they'd have a slightly bit of a party at the end of it. And these grew in popularity um, around the 19th century to the extent that when a pattern was being held, you had market stalls set up on the side and it attracted a huge amount of people. And there was all sorts of other stuff going on, dancing, <laughs> faction fighting, um, and the church really wanted to stamp out patterns as well. Uh, another thing the church wanted to stamp out was wailing at wakes. So wailing at wakes done by a professional keener. Um, so you would, this is where in, up until the mid-19th century and beyond to be fair, but it really died out after the mid-19th century. You, if you, any good funeral, you would, the person, the chief mourner would pay somebody to come along and cry at the funeral. And it wasn't just that they just come along and start weeping. This was a professional keener um, after the Irish for Queen who crying. And she would have to be a really good um, wailer or keener. And there was a certain way that they had to wail. And the, the keeners didn't wail like that outside of funeral houses, outside of a funeral atmosphere, should I say, because they felt that it drew up all sorts of spirits. So there's a huge amount of traditions associated with wakes. Um, that the Catholic Church really did not like, uh, felt that they were superstitious, going against church teachings, desperately trying to stamp them out. Um, they eventually died out uh, on their own, but people just kept this up, and it was huge. Um, so you have this, that's just Catholic customs, um, but you have this belief in general amongst Christian people in very old, um, ancient ways, and a general belief in the parallel unseen other world as well. And this actually governed the building of houses, but it governed living in these homes as well in many ways. So how it governed the building of a house is that you, when you were choosing a site to build your house on, um, you would effectively, and this sounds ridiculous, but go with me on this, you would effectively apply for planning permission to the fairies. And that would mean marking out your site and putting a pile of stones in each corner of of the, the building, and if those stones remained untouched for three consecutive nights, 
you had the go-ahead to build. Um, there was another thing as well, you weren't supposed to build near what was thought to be a fairy path. And uh, there was other things as well, there was foundation sacrifice, so, uh, or, or foundation offerings, so a lot of houses that you would think were, were fairly kind of innocent looking um, might have a horse's head buried under the fireplace, you know. So um, there was an awful lot of very things that we perceive to be very strange today. Um, but also living in the house, you had to protect things from weird activity, fairy activity and, and bad luck and so forth. And um, just going back to the hearth there, um, the hearth had to be protected as well because it was a way of getting into the house but also a way of getting out of the house as well. So um, there was an idea, particularly uh, around May Day or Baltina, that if you were the first one to light a fire on that particular day, the fire was so potent on that day that um, your look, essentially your look for the year could go out with the chimney smoke. Very, very odd to us today, but nonetheless a very popular belief. So um, just talking about anyway, shared uh, beliefs from prehistory, um, that you have this whole idea that of Christianity coming in in the 5th century and then the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. But prior to all of that, we're all living on this island and um, we're either Christian or pre-Christian. And that's a holy well there. Um, I think it's Yol in um, Tipperary. I, I, I think, and then you've got things like corn dollies, and of course the St. Bridget's Cross, which we associate with Catholicism today, but it's much more ancient than that, um, and it's poss quite possibly a pagan symbol. So, um, just going on to the whole idea of fairies, and how you have this idea that um, this despite the Christian beliefs of the people, there kind of remains this belief in fairies or land spirits. If we, if we don't call them fairies, every time I say the word fairies, it kind of attracts a bit of a giggle, and um, you kind of immediately think of something from Walt Disney. But these are more land spirits connected to the Irish countryside. And it was really important to, um, especially if you were a farmer and involved in growing crops or livestock, to understand that these could have an adverse effect on your farm, you could, uh, they could have uh, do something bad to your livestock, or your crops, or your health, or your look in general. So you had to appease the fairies constantly, or the land spirits, or the <laughs> other world. And you do this through various rituals, so you leave out offerings, and places associate, associated with fairies were carefully avoided. So I have here from left to right, I have gorse. We call it gorse and sligo, don't we? Or do we call it furs? Wins. Yeah. Regional variations. But you know the yellow flower. Mm -hmm. And um, at May Day or St. John's Day, it's really useful to hang this over your door, isn't it? And this was done in Sligo Town until recently. Now that's because um, fairies hate the colour yellow. And that's very convenient because the time when fairies are at their most active is May Day. And what's the most popular flower there? You've got like buttercups, you've got um, mayflowers, you've got primroses of various shades of yellow. So that's very handy. But this will keep away uh, fairies. They don't cross yellow. And then uh, we've got our brown bread, then our brown soda bread, popular from the mid-19th century because that's when uh, bicarbonate of soda was introduced. And you could make it in <laughs> great iron um, <laughs> flat pots around the fire. And of course, what's in the middle of it? A big cross there. And that acts like, well, it helps the bread raise, uh, it's a <laughs> bread rise rather, but it also is, look, it's a cross, you're putting it on against fairy activity, okay? And then of course we have our iron horseshoe, and this is another thing that fairies do not like, iron. They won't cross iron. Um, and what you tend to, there's a, a habit, an old habit, um, I think I have a picture of a cradle, but you had these low wooden cradles in cottages and um, there was an idea that fairies were always looking out for human children to kidnap, and particularly little boys. And um, what a mother would do is if she had to leave uh, her baby for a minute, she'd pop it into the cradle and get the tongs from the fire and just, obviously not when they're red hot, but just rest them across the cradle and that would stop them getting in. Um, and also, um, in parts of the west of Ireland, boys were dressed as girls because the it would, you know, confuse the fairy was about to rob them into the other world. 
And then you have this whole idea of changeling. So, you know, if something terrible happened to your poor child and they they had they changed personality for whatever reason, usually due to illness, um, people would say, "Well, the fairies have taken that and they've um, left this." fairy child in its place called a changeling and there's an awful lot of awful stories about things connected to that. So that's iron. But also I have um, just in there on the right is um, a rowan branch. Certain types of timber as well um, were thought to be potent against fairy activity. So um, using timber in a particular way, um, like hanging it up in your house or burning it or um, including it in a garland, that was very useful against it as well. And of course other timbers as well. Usually, yeah, just going back to the whole holy well idea, um, you have usually got ash and hawthorn growing at holy wells, so there's usually a holy well tree. And you can, if, depending on, on whether it's a tree for offerings, you can hang offerings on it. Um, and you have this tradition in England and parts of Scotland as well, where you get, if you have an ailment or if you have a problem, uh, you get you bring a rag with you to these particular rag trees and you tie it onto the tree and the whole idea is it's this kind of sympathetic magic whereby as that rag kind of wastes away um, so too will your problem or so too will your illness and um, so you have this kind of idea that um, trees can be potent as well but usually um, ash, uh, hawthorn or um, rowan Rowan as well, or mountain ash. Down at Tiffany, there's a well, and uh, only a few months ago uh, I was in it, and it's the mountain cloth. Yeah, 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 it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Even to yeah. this day, people, yeah. are, people yeah. still try it. Like, do yeah. people do that at the Holy Well as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they do yeah. with certain, but I, yeah. this was, I never seen as much. Yeah. The whole edge was. There's a lot of worry or problems, <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's basically uh, really kind of just kind of a synopsis of some traditions and I'm just going to briefly talk here about the four seasons and I've already kind of introduced them and what they are. So the old Irish calendar and some people still subscribe to it today um, it's, it's made up of two halves of the year so one is bright and one is dark. And the bright half would be your Balatina and your Lunasa, your summer and autumn, and then your, or maybe, sorry, your, your spring and summer, in bulk and Balatina. And then Lunasa and Samhain would be your dark part, or, you know, slightly overhanging there. Um, so there's certain things that you have to do on certain um, festival feast days and each of these four seasons was marked by a beginning kind of like a festival feast day um, so very quickly I'm going to talk about this more at the end because it's the one closest to us but in bulk is the one that's coming up and that's what we know today as Bridget's Day and we know about St. Bridget of Kildare she's I think she's a 5th century this is the real St. Bridget and then you've got the mythical St. Bridget the, the land goddess and um, you know that that people all over Europe kind of recognize and worship in terms of um, pagan worship in the past. Um, but you've all these kind of traditions um, associated with St. Bridget. With the, with the whole of Imbolc itself, that season is driven uh, by, is, is also, sorry, it's also marked by Shrove Tuesday in Easter. And Shrove Tuesday is the next kind of big feast after St. Bridget's Day. And you can see there, that's Pancake Tuesday or Mardi Gras or you know it's 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 a very common tradition amongst uh, lots of people everywhere and that's the big pig out before Lent and one tradition in Ireland is that you keep your Christmas holly so if you haven't thrown it out yet keep it and you burn it in the fire on Shrove Tuesday for long <coughs> and the dog agrees with me there that as well um, so that is in bulk so that's um, February March and April, and then at the end of April, always on ja always on the eve of a feast day, that's when you start your celebration. So we don't celebrate St. Bridget on February the 1st only. We start our celebrations on the vigil on su at sundown on January the 31st. That's how, that's how we do it on Halloween as well. October 31st, we celebrate November 1st by having the, the vigil, the, the kind of the fail at the evening before. Even Christmas Eve in Ireland, 
we kind of start our celebrations, you know, with the candle in the window time at Christmas Eve. Um, so we see this an awful lot. And then on April the 31st, or, or 30 days, has April got a 31st? Is it 30 days? Um, 30. 30. 30. 30. 30 of April. Thanks for that. 30th of April, you have, uh, as soon as it's sundown, you start your May um, celebrations. And that's Baltana, and that's all about protecting the dairy. It's the start of summer. In May Day, uh, May Day is a huge celebration, you know, across Europe. Um, and you've lots of different traditions there. You've the Maypole, you've May Bushes as well, which is similar to the, the, the rag bush you saw, but this is one that's purposefully decorated. Um, for May Day, and that will contain all sorts of mad decorations, including eggshells that were kept from Easter, um, and people dance around them. And the whole idea is that on the first, from the thirtieth, from May Eve, all throughout May Day, fairy power is at its height. And people were extremely paranoid that, you know, bad luck was going to come into their house at this time. And they took all sorts of measures, like they left out flowers on doorsteps, and even with cattle to protect them. <coughs> Not only were fairies seen to um, want to steal your children all the time, they wanted to steal your dairy, and the dairy was the profit of the house. So people would actually get flowers, of course, what colour, yellow and lemon, shades of lemon and all sorts of yellow flowers, would be made into a garland, and people would actually hang them around the cow's tails to protect them. And they would sprinkle them on wells, they would have bonfires, and it was all sorts of rituals, um, especially divination. There was this whole idea on any of these seasons, so on Imbolc or Baltina, on, on the feast days of these seasons, if you like, at the beginning of these seasons, it was always a great time to um, have divination ceremony. So um, what, was, what, what is my future going to be? Who am I going to marry? Um, what's the weather going to be like? These were all seen to be really great times to predict things, and there was all sorts of rituals connected with that. And then Lunasa, um, or all the September, October, um, again marked with, it's the time of the harvest, and it's marked with all sorts of things. One tradition there is the Kaliak tradition. So do you see that kind of plaited, singular plaited, uh, it's actually a piece of straw that's all tied up? That's the last sheaf, or the Kaliak as it's known in Irish. And basically, this was the last sheaf to be cut um, during the, the harvesting of the crops. And it was cut very carefully and ceremoniously. And um, so let's say, you know, um, the person who was in charge, let's say the person who, the farmer who was um, in charge of all of the, um, all of the workers would then take the, this sort of plaited, crudely plaited thing, and it came in different forms with different regions around the country. And um, that would seem to be a very powerful thing. If, so, if your enemy got hold of that, and performed a ritual whereby they stabbed it and then buried it, you would gradually waste away. It's almost like voodoo, isn't it? So the Kali had to be really protected. And again, like an awful lot of the stuff here I'm talking about is stuff that into living memory would have, belief in it would have persisted. So it's not very ancient. I know I'm talking an awful lot about stuff that came from pre-Christian times, but all of the traditions I'm talking about would have gone well into the 20th century anyway, belief in the the other thing here that uh, you can see is, um, you see the berries there, it's kind of like a little wreath with berries, mm. they're bilberries and again there was a huge industry in bilberry picking in Ireland in the past and again up until living memory and these grow up in mountains from, and they're right from about August and um, they were huge in the UK so consequently loads of people are picking them mm. and they'd be exported straight away to the UK so you could have a uh, couple of baskets of bilberries collected, say in Tupper Curry, and over in Piccadilly Circus the next morning they could have been over. So they were huge, and young people used these as a handy way of making money out of foraging. And they were very much associated with Garland Sunday, and of course we have our Garland Sunday traditions here down at the Holy Well and down at the lake, um, and it's something that's very much associated with um, Sligo. It's also associated with uh, I suppose most famously in Ireland, Pro Patrick. There's um, some mountains in the north of Ireland as well that are very much associated with Garland Sunday. But um, out in Ballymoat, then one of the, I suppose one of the big places that it was associated with was Kesh Hill, and you had all sorts of rituals going on there as well. Um, and I've included as well a harvest knot. So you see this um, little kind of sheaf of um, of grass there with uh, it's plaited. So they would have been worn um, in 
in the lapels of people, young people who were bilberry picking or associated with the harvest. And they were just emblematic of your trade, really, if you were good at harvesting crops. Um, you have the whole basket of spuds there. Um, so that, I suppose, this is the, the harvest is a really important time uh, for people. Um, and particularly on Garland Sunday, you were ritually having your first meal of potatoes. Garland Sunday is the 25th, around the 25th of July. It's the last Sunday in July. So um, people would uh, lay rushes on the floor to welcome the harvest ritually and then you'd have your first meal of new potatoes and if you didn't eat that first meal of new potatoes then you were liable to go hungry for the rest of the year mm -hmm. so um and then towards the end then towards the end of september you have michaelmas 29th of september and that's why i've included the picture of the two unfortunate looking geese then because that's the geese harvest and on the 29th of september it's when you eat the goose um, and then going into October, then of course, um, the harvest becomes a bit, you know, it, it, the focus is on storage of foodstuffs. And then you've got Halloween coming up as well. And then in Halloween, the 31st, yes. going into November the 1st. So we've got the year's end there. Uh, that, in case anyone is wondering, is a drawing of a hollowed out turnip. So turnips were used an awful lot. Um, not only as candle holders at Christmas, but also as a very spooky lantern at Halloween um, and the whole idea that blackberries after um, sorry blackberries after the 29th of September sorry I, I'll ha I could be I could be um, wrong with this I can't quite remember off the top of my head but I think it's after Halloween you can't eat blackberries because the puka who's another mythical mm -hmm. creature on par with the banshee leprechaun and everything else will have defecated on them definitely mm -hmm. So you're not supposed to eat, that's why you're not supposed to eat blackberries. Of course, they're not at their best at that time. They're probably full of maggots, but that was the legend that kept children from eating them. Um, and then as we go into um, just um, November the 11th then is Martinmas. Does anybody remember Martinmas? Do you hear about Martinmas? So again, another really old custom is one on Martinmas is that you have blood sacrifice in the home. And again, this comes into living memory. So you sacrifice um, uh, some type of fowl. It could be a hen or a goose. You cut its throat. You don't, do you know the way with black pudding and other foodstuffs, you, you rescue every bit of the food. In, on Martin Mass, the blood was collected but wasn't eaten. And you had it collected on a piece of cloth and stored in the rafters of the roof. And that was meant to be very good for, as a cure for bleeding. Or if somebody was going on a, on a journey, they would take this blood-soaked tissue with them. And not only that, but blood was dripped on the, on the doorways of houses as well to stop evil spirits coming in. And it's extraordinary to think that this is a really old... Nobody can tell you exactly where this blood sacrifice came from. There's some speculation that it came from, because it's so close to the European um, time of Yule, that, um, that there's some connection with blood sac pagan blood sacrifice then. But um, it's Martin Mass is when the slaughter of animals takes place so that the foods can be ready for Christmas. But the actual dripping of blood, nobody really knows where that actually came from. But it has to be pagan. It just didn't arise out of nowhere. And it was practiced in most parts of the country. And then at, we skip forward into Christmas. Um, we have the Wren boys or the Ram boys, depending on what parts of the country you come from. And again, they're not active in all parts of the country, um, but uh, there's seasonal variations of these where they might turn into straw boys for a wedding. Um, and that, of course, we all know, I'm sure, the procession of Wren boys going around with a, with a dead bird. Again, pretty um, pagan uh, idea to go around with a, a dead bird on a stick looking for money. Um, so what I'm just going to, I'm going to finish off quite soon, right, but I want to focus on some of the traditions of St. Bridget's Day and Imbolc, um, because, simply because it's coming up close to us. And the visual here is a St. Bridget's Cross that's of Sligo Leitrim style. Um, has that, is anyone familiar with these? <laughs> the style of Bridget's Cross, I'm sure. Yeah, so basically this is kind of indigenous to our region here. Um, but if I show you the next slide, there's loads of different types of Bridget's Crosses. So I'm just going to, because I'm biased and I'm from Sligo, I'm going to focus on the nicest one of all. Um, 
So just to talk about it, so in bulk is the name of the season, but it, it, it could also mean um, in bulk or the, in the belly, which is related to the time when sheep are all pregnant and our livestock, um, sheep particularly, are expectant. And um, that's basically where it kind of comes from and it's associated with milk and child rearing and, and all the rest of it. So, like I said to you before, festivals in old Irish tradition begin at sundown the previous day. So, St. Bridget's celebrations start on January 31st, and it's called St. Bridget's Eve, just like St. Christmas Eve. Um, and it's called Iha Fela Brigia. And um, it celebrates, it's a jewel festival, because it celebrates the real Christian saint, but also it celebrates you know, like typical Irish people like to hang on to their old customs. It also celebrates the ancient goddess Bridget. And in Irish homes on the 31st, you had a small feast. Um, and when I say small feast, we're talking about Colcannon and maybe a bit of soda cake or something like that. Very humble. And prayer. And you have this idea as well that there's a belief that St. Bridget passes over all of Ireland bestowing her blessing to the countryside and I suppose the, the fact that she's seen as a, an agricultural type of land goddess is the belief that St. Bridget is accompanied on her travels by a white cow. Now tell me any other saint, <laughs> Christian saint that's accompanied by a farm animal. It just kind of brings it into stark relief that this is for farmers, for, for farming luck and to, to celebrate the land I suppose in many ways. So she's, a, she's an ancient goddess. And um, one of the things you can do on the 31st, not on the 1st, but on the 31st, if you leave a little cloth out on a bush, not something massive now, you just want something that can fit into your pocket. And if you leave it out, she'll bestow her blessing on that. And that cloth will have curative powers from then on. And that's called the Brat Breedia, or Bridge's Cloak. I did it last year. I did it work. Uh, well, yeah, I, I washed um, my throat with it a couple of times and I had a sore throat, so whether it was just psychosomatic or whatever, yeah. it, it, just, it was comforting anyway. Yeah, very good. It is, you see, a lot of these things are, you, you're, it's like, it's like taking the paracetamol and the ibuprofen at the same time. Mm. You're kind of going at it from lots of angles and you think, oh, I got a bit of relief from that. A lot of people say it's psychosomatic, mm. but who knows, who knows, like, um, and then on the eve of, of St. Bridget, you have the making of St. Bridget's crosses from rushes that are pulled, not cut. And again, I can't tell you why they're pulled, not cut, but they, they are. And you can also use straw or reed. An awful lot of Sligo Leitrim St. Bridget's crosses are made of reed. My old uncle used to make them from <coughs> reed, got from riverbeds, and really big ones as well. Um, the old cross is burned. Sometimes it's kept. It depends on what area you live in. And the new one is made. So again, that seems very sacrilegious, doesn't it, to be burning a religious object. You wouldn't get that in the Christian church. But it's perfectly acceptable to burn it. And again, that, the whole idea of burning something and renewal for the year ahead, that's completely linked with pre-Christian beliefs. Um, so we'll have a quick look at um, some variations in St. Bridget's Cross. So you've got the three-legged one there. That would have been hung in barns and outbuildings because animals need their luck as well. And there was a belief with Bridget's crosses, uh, and they didn't have to be crosses, there's a Bridget's wheel there, see the roundy one. Mm. Um, the belief was that mm. they protected the house against fire. And uh, obviously they were very good luck. And you have this idea as well, some people have commented on the, you see the kind of lozenge shape in the middle that kind of goes around, it's like a, a square spiral. Mm. Um, there's a a certain school of thinking that kind of links this with really ancient beliefs in, you know, Newgrange and the, the, the spiral artwork and the lozenges. There's a belief system that, you know, that is very similar. Or you can see yourself, it is very similar. Um, and the fact that it makes a cross is very handy, you know, for if, if you're Christian, because it, it covers everything. Um, so there's a three-legged one for the, the animals in the sheds. And um, then you have stick crosses with a woven rush center and sticks coming out. Um, and then you have the wheel. And then on the day itself, there's loads of other variations, by the way. That's not an exhaustive collection of crosses. It depends on what part of the country or what, what way you used to make them yourself. Of course, the one in the middle then was used by RTE for so mm. long. And that, um, that's the most popular one. And they're really easy to make as well. Like They're the perfect primary school project. 
they can be rustled up in a matter of minutes and um, you know there are people who have them in their houses, offices, I've seen them hanging in cars, you know, so they're, no wonder they're popular. <coughs> But on the 1st of February then, you've got their little traditions, and I'll just go quickly through a few of these. So, um, you've this idea that it's a time to take stock, literally, of, you're going to look around the house and think, well, what foodstuffs are there in the house? Let's make a list of, you know, will we run out before um, food production on the farm begins again? Or uh, should I check these flour sacks here to see if we have enough stock in the house? So it's this day, this idea of taking stock. And it's also an idea, or it's also a day of taking stock in the farmyard as well. So you're checking out the animal fodder to see if you have enough supplies <coughs> to do you until the summer. And a farmer who had enough fodder to do him for the summer, by Saint, at the time of St. Bridget's Day, that was considered a real point of pride to the farmer, if you had enough fodder left to do you. It's also a time for visiting holy wells associated with St. Bridget. And if you took water from them on that day, it was particularly potent and was very curative. Um, it's also a day of rest, so no wheels to be turned. So if you're in a society um, where no wheels are to be turned on a particular day, that's great news because it generally means a day off for everybody. So anybody who is working um, you know, a cart or a spinning wheel or anything associated with transport, you get the day off. And again, this is folk tradition. Unfortunately, we don't officially get the day off. Um, you also have this idea of um, Biddy Boys processions with a crease breeder. Now, what I'm talking about there is Biddy Boys were guys that were like, almost like the Wren Boys. They dress up in all sorts of costumes and go from house to house looking for money or food. It was considered um, really unlucky to refuse them uh, some sort of offering. And they would carry with them the breed oak. So you see that weird looking stuffed mm -hmm. straw dolly there with her with her jacket on her. Um, they would carry that with them and that would be representative of St. Bridget and if you gave them an offering they'd pretend that she was blessing you, right? Um, so you can just imagine the Catholic Church wouldn't have liked this at all, you know? Um, because it's a corn dolly and they're, 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 the crowd are taking it upon themselves to bless and that's going into all sorts of grey areas and it wasn't really liked. But you have this very interesting thing here, the Creus Frigia, and the Biddy Boys would take those with them on a procession. And that's like this massive um, straw rope in a circle with the three crosses. And if you stepped through that, and it depends on where you lived in the country, um, but if you stepped through it three times, you'd have luck and health for the coming year. And um, women would, there was a different way of stepping through it for men and women. So women, I think, would pull it down over their heads and men would step through it and it would, it would go the reverse anyway. And then, as the festival closed, you had this idea of weather divination. So people would try and figure out what the weather for the year was going to be like based on activity on St. Bridget's Day. Um, it was the official mark of the tillage season as well, but obviously you can't go out digging on the 1st of February, it's probably frosty or something. But farmers would ceremoniously take their spade and go out and break the soil, and that would officially mark the start of the tillage season. And based on the weather, of course, on St. Bridget's Day, you try and figure out. So I think um, if it was a, a clear, fine day on St. Bridget's Day, it meant, it meant a terrible year ahead, weather-wise. Oh, no. um, that's just one, but there's loads of others. <clears throat> and finally, finally, at the close of St. Bridget's Day, before you went to sleep, you'd get some of the extra rushes left over from where you were making your crosses. And... If you were a, a girl, you would make it into a little ladder shape. And if you were a boy, you'd make it into a wheel shape. And the wheel would denote women, and the ladder would kind of mean men. So if you were a girl going off to bed, you take the ladder which, and you put it under your pillow. And likewise, the boy would put the wheel under his pillow. And that night, you were supposed to dream of who you were going to marry. So that was marriage divination. So that's just... Um, a taste, I suppose, in an hour of some, I suppose, customs that we would have no matter, I suppose, what religion we subscribe to um, or whatever our beliefs, that you still have this very deep-rooted idea of 
chance and everything. You know, it, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. It might bring me some luck, it might not, but I'm not definitely not going to um, mess with that tree. And I'm definitely, just, just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna put this poker across the child's cradle, you know? But it's this whole idea that we kind of, um, we've all these beliefs in Ireland and they're fascinating and they're deep rooted and they're so deep rooted that many of them survive with us today. Thank you for listening and thank you to Dr. McGarry for the interesting talk about historical Irish customs and rituals. Next week we are joined by Simone Hickey. Simone holds an MA in Historical and Heritage Studies of the Northwest and lectures in Folklore and History at St. Angela's College Sligo. She is currently writing a book focusing on the men from Sligo who fought in the Great War and never returned. Simone was instrumental in creating the Armistice Day Walk in 2018 and she is part of the team Lest Sligo Forgets, developing a memorial garden to the men and women from Sligo who lost their lives because of the Great War in 2014 to 2018. We hope you tune in again next week. Till then, take care.